It all began with a petty incident in a Manchester nightclub when a drink was thrown by a criminal from one group over another. The alleged cause of the fallout was because one of their number bought a Breitling watch from another which turned out to be a fake. This incident set off a chain of events that resulted in four years of intense violence, including two murders, multiple shootings, and a dangerous cycle of retaliatory attacks reminiscent of the notorious Gunchester era in the 1990s. Mark Fellows, known as the Iceman due to his calm exterior, was central to this wave of violence and became one of only 70 individuals in England and Wales to receive a whole life sentence when he was found guilty of the brutal murders of his gangland rivals, Paul Massey and John Kinsella. In July 2015, Fellows used an Uzi submachine gun to unleash a hail of 18 bullets upon Massey, followed by the cold-blooded killing of Kinsella three years later. These execution-style murders sent shockwaves through the criminal underworld of northwest England. Massey had gained notoriety for his involvement in the drug trade during Manchester's rave scene in the 1990s, yet he remained a prominent figure in Salford. Kinsella similarly commanded both respect and fear. He famously had intervened when a gangster threatened to harm former England footballer Stephen Gerrard, earning him a reputation as a formidable enforcer in Merseyside. Kinsella even served as a pallbearer at Massey's funeral. The unresolved murder of Massey and Kinsella cast a dark shadow over the Greater Manchester Police for three years. With a list of 112 potential suspects, consisting of key figures from the Salford underworld, detectives faced a daunting challenge as the public remained silent, fearing the consequences of speaking out. You are watching OCG TV. We are continuing to build our channel to be the best version it can be. We would truly appreciate it if you subscribe to the channel if you don't already. Now, let's begin the first chapter. Chapter 1. Mr. Big Paul Massey was a well-known figure in and around Manchester. He had previously gained his nickname as Salford's Mr. Big at an acrimonious council meeting in 1992 when one councillor claimed that he was behind civil disturbances in the city. For decades, he wielded influence in parts of Salford. Police were keen to arrest him, but he won admirers in some quarters for his hostility to heroin publicly expressed in stickers that went up on lampposts warning, you smack and get smacked. In April 2015, he denied rumours that he had been asked by police to intervene as a mediator after a series of four violent incidents in February and March, including two shootings and separate attacks with a machete and a grenade. A former associate of Massey's claimed to a British media outlet that he was murdered after trying to mediate between the two groups when their feud became increasingly violent. Police believe Massey was aligned to one of those groups, nicknamed the A-Team, and the rival group, the Anti-A-Team, ordered the hit. At 7.23pm on July 26, 2015, Paul Massey arrived at a bargain booze located on the outskirts of Manchester, England, and parked his silver BMW 5 Series. He had just arrived back from Winkup's holiday camp, situated on the Irish Sea in North Wales. However, his getaway did not provide the desired relaxation. Massey found himself burdened with two mobile phones that incessantly buzzed as numerous individuals sought his assistance. Upon entering the store, he requested his regular purchase, a bottle of Bacardi and two litres of Coke. After leaving a tip for the cashier using the change, he swiftly departed within a minute. Shortly after, a mysterious individual trailed him only 17 seconds behind. Upon his return from vacation, Massey dedicated his afternoon to spending time with two members of his gang. He then proceeded to visit a bookie, purchase Bacardi and Cokes, and finally drove the short distance back to his spacious red brick colonial home, which was set back from a bustling road and guarded by wrought iron gates. Unbeknownst to Massey, an attacker had been alerted by an individual who had been tailing him. This assailant patiently waited nearby. At precisely 7.27pm, as Massey exited his vehicle, a tall and athletic man swiftly crossed the road. 
Disguised with a fake beard and dressed in combat attire, he swiftly drew out an Uzi and commenced firing. This marked the beginning of a scenario that Mr. Big had long anticipated. In fact, during an interview with the BBC in the late 1990s, he had expressed his preparedness for such an event, stating, If it's meant to happen, it's meant to happen. I'm aware of the risks involved. In the driveway, Massey experienced a sudden and intense pain in his left shin. The force of the impact caused bone fragments to scatter onto the gravel. In the midst of the chaos, he accidentally dropped the Bacardi bottle, causing it to shatter. As if things couldn't get any worse, a bullet struck three of his fingers on his right hand, completely tearing off one of them. Despite these injuries, Massey managed to find cover behind some trash bins and quickly dialed 999 for help. The assailant confidently approached the bins and continued to shoot at Massey. Out of the 18 bullets fired from the gun, one proved to be particularly devastating. It pierced through Massey's fifth rib on his left side, penetrated his chest cavity and inflicted severe damage to his heart, lungs and back. As Massey's chest filled with blood and the ground became stained, the shooter swiftly crossed the street, dashed through the graveyard of the parish church of St Anne and made his way towards a wooded area. Without wasting any time, he hopped onto a bicycle and rode away, leaving the scene behind. This audacious escape by Mr Big's assassin captivated the attention of British tabloids, who couldn't resist drawing comparisons to the thrilling dramas of Peaky Blinders or The Sopranos. Despite the police identifying over 100 individuals of interest, the case remained unsolved. In order to comprehend the enigma surrounding the infamous assassination of a prominent individual, it is imperative to grasp the essence of the Salford Code, which can be succinctly summarised in two words. Within the context of this realm, the principle is clear. Don't grass. Chapter 2. Killing Kinsella On the 5th of May, 2018, Father of two, John Kinsella was strolling with his American Bulldogs on a rural road near Junction 7 of M62 at Rainhill, accompanied by his pregnant partner, Wendy Owen. Unexpectedly, the couple was approached from behind by an individual wearing a mask and a high-visibility vest, riding a mountain bike cleverly disguised. This masked gunman shot Kinsella twice in the back, causing him to collapse instantly. Miss Owen recounted how she observed the Iceman calmly approach her injured partner and mercilessly fire two additional shots at close range into the back of his head. During the investigation into Kinsella's shooting, police discovered CCTV security footage that did not capture the actual murder, but instead showed an unidentified man riding a bicycle towards Kinsella's residence at approximately 5am. Although the man's face was obscured, he bore a striking resemblance to Fellows. Consequently, on May 30, 2018, authorities apprehended Fellows upon his arrival at Manchester Airport from Amsterdam via an EasyJet flight, suspecting him of being responsible for both murders. Despite their attempts to interview him at the police station, Fellows remained silent. Mark Fellows had spent the afternoon after the murder with his mother at the Trafford Centre eating at Zizi Restaurant and buying a trendy pair of £165 mallet trainers from Tasuti. Later, he socialised with pals in the pub and enjoyed a meal at KFC. He flew out to Amsterdam on holiday a few days later. If he had committed the murder, he did not look spooked. Fellows was widely known to authorities for his affiliation with the anti-A-team, his involvement with the group drew attention when he was shot in the buttocks shortly after Massey's murder. However, he was never arrested. Despite having a criminal record consisting of five convictions for various offences, such as robbery and illegal possession of ammunition, Fellow's past did not indicate any involvement in assassination activities. Fellow's had a distinctive appearance, with a square jawline and a slender physique reminiscent of a runner rather than a professional killer. As a native of Salford, he seemed to lead a quiet and unassuming life. Due to childhood illness, he wore a colostomy bag and was meticulous about his personal hygiene and well-being. 
He had two young children and worked night shifts as a sous chef, specialising in sauce preparation for a company that produced chilled and frozen foods. The evidence against Fellows was not conclusive. However, law enforcement did discover a dubious smartphone in his possession. This device had been altered in a way that allowed it to enter an encrypted mode by simultaneously pressing the power button and a volume button. This was by no means a crime in itself, but it did spark the interest of detectives, who wondered why one would own an encrypted device unless trying to hide nefarious activity. Specifically, police were concerned that this was the type of device a hitman would use to communicate with a spotter. A short time later, that suspected spotter was arrested. Stephen Boyle, prosecutors would allege, was a friend and associate of Fellows. He was suspected of trailing Massey in a car after the bargain booze pit stop back in 2015, and he was lying in wait in 2018, signalling the Iceman when Kinsella and his dogs approached. Like Fellows, Boyle, at 35, had a litany of small-time convictions. When he was arrested at a hotel outside of Manchester, Boyle opened his mouth. I haven't murdered anybody, but I probably know more things about it than I should. While Boyle's tease was shocking, it wasn't enough. Police needed hard evidence to box him in. That was the goal when they raided Mark Fellows' flat, searching for anything that could link him to the murders. They didn't find the bicycle from the CCTV footage. They didn't find a murder weapon. What they did find was a mundane piece of evidence that, in concert with a loose-lipped gang member, unspooled both cases. A Garmin Forerunner 10 GPS watch. Fellows had a passion for long-distance running and relied on his Garmin Forerunner 10 GPS watch to track his progress. Recently, he successfully completed the 10K segment of the Great Manchester Run, finishing in an impressive 47 minutes. Official race photos captured him nearing the finish line with his hair dishevelled and wearing a tank top over a long-sleeved running shirt, while the Garmin watch remained attached to his left wrist. Investigators extracted data from the device and discovered that Fellows had utilised it to monitor not just his jogging sessions, including the Manchester 10K, but also a sequence of reconnaissance missions. He had the foresight to refrain from using the watch while cycling to and from the actual murders. During one of these excursions, three months prior to Massey's murder, Fellows had journeyed from his residence in Salford to the field across the road from Massey's house. The watch recorded speeds indicative of a person on a bicycle rather than on foot and indicated that the wearer had manually ceased recording his location while standing near the small stone church. He spent a total of eight minutes there having identified his position and escape route. Chapter 3. A Betrayal The following trial was accompanied by an exceptionally high level of security surpassing any previous cases witnessed by the prosecutors. The jury at Liverpool Crown Court was strictly prohibited from being photographed and the use of mobile phones was strictly forbidden. During the six-week trial, the prosecution argued that Fellows had been hired to carry out both murders, with Boyle assisting him on each occasion. Fellows' defence attorney chose not to call any witnesses while the defence for Boyle's alleged role as a spotter called Boyle himself to testify. It was during this testimony that Boyle shocked everyone once again. He claimed that he had no involvement in the murder of Massey. However, in Kinsella's case, he admitted to being present under the belief that it was a drug deal. It was then that Fellows killed Kinsella and handed Boyle a revolver concealed within a sock inside a backpack. Boyle's defence was met with disdain by the prosecution, who scoffed at it. The jury, at the very least, remained unconvinced and did not believe his defence. After 31 hours of careful consideration and discussion, the 12-person panel reached a verdict of guilty for Boyle in Kinsella's murder. However, he was cleared of any involvement in Massey's homicide due to a lack of evidence. As a result, Boyle received a life sentence with the potential for parole after 33 years. On the other hand, Fellows was found guilty on both counts and received the same sentence, but without the possibility of parole. This was an exceptionally rare penalty in Great Britain, 
ensuring that he would spend the rest of his life in prison. During the reading of the sentences, Fellows displayed a smirk on his face. As the guards escorted him out of the courtroom, it was reported that he made a throat-slashing gesture directly towards his co-defendant. If Boyle's decision to turn on Fellows was genuine and not the result of a scheme between them, it makes him a marked man who can never return to Salford.